People t there tends to be a point of confusion around understanding the structure of the soul. And the reason why I think it's important to, to sort it out and to understand it is because, like Professor Malik was saying, that it's fundamental to how we understand human nature and how we approach the human being. So the idea of why we deal with this model and try to understand it and sort it out is not to encourage people to get uh, so into the microcosms of understanding the specifics of it, but because we need to understand the structure of what we're working with to keep us in line with the paradigm. Without having a, a clear understanding, what happens is it will, it will make us um, grasp on to what's already well-defined, which is this notion of the self for, that is not spiritual. So it's really, really important that we make an effort to understand this structure, not to like use it so theoretically in practice, but for our own selves to orient ourselves. Um, and so people ha have conceptualized it differently uh, within Islamic psychology. Um, for instance, this one is a very simple one from uh, 2013. Uh, Amber Hawk and Human Teshavarzi wrote a paper, and then uh, Professor Skinner made this model, I don't know how, how many years ago? 1989, so I think right when he was writing that paper uh, and, and realizing needed some sort of more structure to understand, he conceptualized it this way. It, it uh, helped us understand this notion of the ruh coming into inspiration into the heart. Um, which the other model doesn't necessarily highlight. And again, all of these models are just different people's way of trying to visualize, make sense, and map out something that is very abstract. So no, there is no correct visual model because it's not a visual, physical thing that exists. Right? It's an abstract concept that our minds are trying to grasp. And so we're using these as tools. And so uh, this is how Professor Skinner uh, mapped it out. Uh, the research that I've been working on, the idea of what I wanted to try to accomplish is finding a way to get some sort of uh, consensual model that, that um, brings in the input of scholars who really understand these intricacies. Because again, when we discuss like, well, what is Akko, what is Ruh, what's the relationship, this is an, an, an entire... Somebody could spend their whole life sorting these things out because scholars have written so much about it and so much of that writing to, to the lay person can be quite confusing because they're talking about things that are built on other sources of knowledge that if you don't understand, it can be disorienting. And so what has tended to be the case is that because we're trying to understand this from psychology, we have psychologists, many of whom may have a great deal of knowledge in Islamic theology, but their main focus is the psychology. And so what my intention was, was to bring in the voices and the knowledge of the scholars, the, class, the um, scholars who understand this and have spent their lives um, really understanding these intricacies from many different angles. So what I, I, what I set out to do was to bring that input in, since I, my specialty is psychology, uh, and so instead of trying to rely on my own understanding, I want to bring in uh, people from, who understand it from the point of view of Islamic philosophy, Islamic theology, even aspects of fiqh, people who have read not just a book of Ghazali, not just Ihya al Madin, but his trajectory of his life, has, his writing, uh, developed over time. And understanding the longer trajectory, it helps us understand what was coming from that. And so what I, what I, my intention was, was to create out of that complexity something that we're, between all these scholars, because there's a lot of disagreements or different interpretations, what are the main things that people of these scholars, at least these 18 that I interviewed, tended to agree on? What, what, what was consensual, consensual to how we can really build a strong foundation for understanding and what is really the most important for our work in psychology as it relates to trying to help somebody develop in their soul. Out of that project, I um, 
I wound up developing a model. So I just wanted to walk through and explain. And again, this is it was my visualization as a map, but it's not my. This was all taken from what the what these 18 scholars contributed. If you look at the board, because I I want to walk you through sort of the development of it. So if we think of first before anything is a lot. And a lot is, has, from what we learn, has brought us into existence and in, has, has created this dunya. And what we're talking about for the most part is uh, our soul as it relates to our life in the dunya. Because that's what we're doing in psychotherapy. We're not necessarily dealing with the barzakh, we're not dealing with the akhira, we're dealing with what's going on here in this world, in this dunya. So it's important for us to understand it in the context of that. So, Allah created this dunya. And in this dunya, He created us. So, this circle is representative, just the circle itself is the human being. So what we know is that the, the ruh is from Allah, breathed into us, the ruh. The ruh is essentially the divine essence, this spark, this, this divine, this life breath that was breathed into us. And like Professor Malik said, in the Quran, it's only this described in the sense of positivity and pureness. And it's even attributed to the Quran, to Jibreel, so it's like the essence of this Tawheed. And so what, what, what we know, you know, um, people like to say whenever this concept of Ruh comes up, people are, I think, afraid to talk about it because it's so abstract and it's so spiritual and it's so unseen and, we, and people like to just sort of, well, we don't know much about it. And people say that, I think, too much because what it does is it's almost like avoiding it. Like, yes, we don't know about it. We don't know the intricacies of the reality of Allah. No. But we need to understand that in us is a spiritual, our, our reality is spiritual. And so when we continually say, well, we don't want, know much about it, it's avoiding our spiritual reality. And so I think because of this, it's really, really important that we recognize and honor the fact that the ruh is part of our makeup. It's part of who we are, and it's, it, it plays a part. So when I'm making these circles of these different elements, it's only because they're spoken of as different components. Not necessarily, they're not necessarily separate things, except for in this conceptualization to a degree, and again, this is abstract concepts of the difference between the ruh and nafs. So, um, as part of, he breathed into us the ruh, but because we're in the dunya, we have this pull, this downward pull towards that, that, that's um, putting us in this physical realm. And so, this is where I think a lot of confusion comes in, is the nafs, this word nafs. The word nafs is used as just to describe the entire soul. But often, because in the Qur'an, as the sister was saying, and, and as Professor Malik uh, validated, it is referred to this word as a negative thing, something we have to control. Not necessarily negative, something we need to control, something that will be judged, uh, something that is really tied to our experience in the dunya. And so, it's important to understand the distinction that sometimes the word nafs is used to just describe the whole person. But when in this model, and in this case, nafs is referring to the aspect of the person that has this animalistic drive that has a downward pull. Okay? And in the realm of the dunya, uh, shaitan, just like in Professor Malik's model, uh, or drawing, shaitan, sorry, exists with only in within this realm of the dunya. And the reason why I decided to make it a triangle is because, to, at least to distinguish that there is absolutely no 
conceptualization that this is in opposite that this is the opposite of that. Not at all. Allah is above everything. Allah is completely separate from this. He, he's the one uh, controlling this whole experience. And part of his creation, uh, shaitan exists in this downward pull. So in this model, upward represents this height, this higher trajectory towards what is pure and what is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this downward pull uh, towards the dunya represents what we're bound to in this life, in this reality. And part of that dunya reality is we, uh, we forget who we really are and we are in separation, an illusion of separation. We're, we're always connected because we always have this connection through the ruh. In this uh, illusion of separation, this test that Baba Malik this described, shaitan is part of that test, it's testing us to to feed into us through different tricks and ways to orient us towards the separation rather than the tawheed, rather than remembering that witnessing from Alastu bi rabbikum bala shahidna. When we, we know inside of us, we have a place that knows. So shaitan is influencing us through the nafs. Not through the ruh, because the ruh is untouchable. It is from Allah and it stays pure. Okay? The nafs can be corrupt, can ru- corrupted. And this is why the nafs is what's judged on the day of judgment after. Uh, because you're judged on how you dealt with that corruption. Did you allow it to persist or did you fight in this battleground of your soul? Now, the battleground happens in the middle here. So in this model, all of the purple is this tension place of the battleground that Professor Malik talked about. The red is representative of this downward pull towards dunya and separation and the illusion of separation of self. And the blue is representative of the purity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ruh, and where we fall in line with that. Now the qalb is the center of our being, of this self, that is where this activity happens to either be oriented towards the downward pull and be, uh, or oriented towards the upward pull towards our, towards the ruh. Now when we, uh, so it's a dynamic aspect. So qalb, the word taqallab means to turn. Qalb turns one way or the other. So the qalb can either turn towards the nafs and be in a state of ghafla, forgetfulness of Allah. We're mired in the dunya and, and mired in this illusion of separation. We have forgotten the witnessing of Allah before coming into this world. And in that, when we're we're oriented towards the dhamma, we're in ghafla. Now, if the qalb is turning towards the nafs, then we're in ghafla, we're in this area, and I'll talk about these things in a minute. And if the qalb is oriented towards the ruh, meaning through the work, the battleground, and we'll talk more about what that work is, it's orienting or turning, and this is an active thing that we're, where it comes into our work on ourselves. Allah does not change the people until they change what is in themselves. This is the work that we're doing to orient ourselves towards this way. So the, the taqallab can happen towards turning towards the ruh, and in that case, then uh, we are more connected to that original witnessing and more in line with our fitrah. Our fitra, remember we talked about before, is the part of us that remembers who we really are, our true identity, and not mired in the self that is only defined by our dunya experience, which is the, what Western psychology only deals with, the self. So the self is all about who this person has become and developed in the dunya and, and, and is in this veil of thinking that they, 
their identity is singular and it's oriented only in this dunya and there's no awareness outside. And so uh, we deal with that, but we try to orient the person away from that, not towards it. The akal, this is where a lot of confusion comes in, because, I, and I, this is, I really tried to sort this out with these scholars, because even among them there's a, people say different things. And Ghazali uses the word akal quite a lot. And a lot, oftentimes he interchanges all four of these things. And, and you get lost. Like, wait, I thought we were talking about cult, suddenly we're talking about akal. Why is this? Because akal, this is, this is how a majority of the scholars that I spoke to uh, uh, conceptualize this. Is that akal, the word akal is not used in the Quran. Yaqiluna. Yaqilun. Uh, is, a, is a function of the kalb, the kalb intellects, okay? Uh, like we talked about the heart having the cognizant heart, the heart has consciousness, right? And the heart is the center of the whole being. So remember Hakim Archuleta was saying, uh, the, mind of the, the mind is a part of the whole body, the whole spirit, there is no separation. So when we're intellecting, we are, uh, so, so some scholars would say, that when akal, when, the, when you're really using the word akal, that that would be a person using their kalb to uh, distinguish, to see things as they are. So if you're, if, you know, so yaki luna would be seeing with your heart. And when you see with your heart, you actually see things in their true reality as they are, because you're, it's a connection, a function of this, uh, the kalb, has this connection to do, and they would say, some people conceptualize this, some do not, would say, and there's different schools of thought even in this. A lot of the Kalam scholars will differ on this. But uh, that if somebody is not, um, is not intellecting correctly, then it would not be akal. If they're not using their heart to, to intellect in this way, then it would not be considered akal. It would be some other distorted mental perception. And, th and this gets confusing because, you know, we talk about, like uh, Professor Malik indicated, there's this rational function of the brain, but it's like a receptor for what, what is the eye that's, that's moving the hand in the Eccles experiment, right? So this, people debate about this for a lot of time. It's not important that we sort it out, and, and, but for our purposes, what is really important is that in Western psychology, the whole thing is akal. I would say this is all they deal with. Akal and nafs. So it's really important that we sort, sort that out for ourselves, is that the akal is a function of the kalb, and our, func our focus should be the kalb. So the reason why I drew it like this is to indicate that this is connected to each other. There, it's important that we talk about akal because it is an important part of Islam. We don't neglect our akal. We, we are supposed to use a rationality, and the akal is the shackle that helps move the kalb and turn it, inshallah, hopefully towards the ruh, but often not. Right? And so when, when the Ghazali talks about the horse and the rider, right, and the, the akal is keeping in check the, the huwa, the hawa, which is... Uh, going towards this downward pull towards, towards shaitan and towards the animalistic energy of the nuts. So I think what's important is just understand akal as just the function that, that motivates the kalb to go one way or the other. And, and oftentimes our perception of how we do that is through logic, rationality, reasoning, knowledge, right? Because by getting, receiving knowledge, we then realize, oh, I need to do this better thing. I need to try to uh, orient myself towards this because it's better, because Allah says it in his book. And it, we're using our knowledge, our, our, our rational mind to, to turn our heart. Is it, is it root? It can be used by the heart or shaitan? Shaitan can influence it. Shaitan can influence the decisions that you make. Influ so therefore it can, uh, shaitan all, shaitan has no control over your heart. Shaitan can 
can throw things at you to distract you and that you get caught up in, that you then are still responsible for turning your heart in that direction. So shaitan only, when he talked about shaitan like in the chest, it's only this chest, not, not deeper into the heart. The shaitan does not have access to the cult. Based on your, if you're pulling the reins too tight, then it's affecting, the, you, there's too much aql involved in, in controlling it. Whereas if it's too loose, then the horse is going to run wild. It's about having this balance. Like I said, it, it can become quite uh, confusing because there's a lot of details of understanding, right? But I want to try to, if you'll be patient with me, to try to give you a sense of how we don't need to get mired in those details because they're underneath that there's something much more important, which is just this notion of this inner heart and how this is, needs to become the identity of the focus, the focus of our identity as human beings. The soul, when it is in a certain state, it takes on these other qualities. They're not separate entities. It's when we, when, and, and, and like you said, this is why Lazali talks about them separately or differently at different times is because when, the, when it has this essence of this certain aspect, then we talk about it in this way. That's an important distinction. I think the, the, the idea of like talking about it as separate things becomes confusing. It, it's, a con, it's a concept. And, and in our minds, think linearly. And we have a very hard time understanding things that are fluid and that are, uh, which essence is Tawheed. Our Akal doesn't think naturally in Tawheed. We want to separate things out. Right? And so the reason Ghazali separates it out for us is because that's how we think. But ultimately, we're talking about things that there's so many deep secrets in them that we can't know. Because it's the realm of Allah. And we, 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 we don't need to know. But the, the exercise that our scholars take us through is useful for us as psychologists because people are going to wonder about these things. And, and, if, and if nothing else, it's helpful to, to detoxify us from the Western idea of the brain and the mind being the wazir of everything. That's not the Islamic model. The, the, the whole thing that I wanted to just point out is that the, the Yaqi Lun function is one aspect that is, uh, that is utilized by the, the heart to orient us towards the right way or the wrong way. But, so we just need to understand that when we're talking about psychology, we're not talking about the psyche in the way that the Western uh, way understands it. It's much more that if we were to talk about the psyche as the soul, we're, we're, more con we're concerned with the soul. And that is the inner, unseen, spiritual entity that exists in the human being. And I think what Professor Malik was saying is, is, is exactly on point. People are afraid to talk about that. I'd rather not even, I'd rather just make this the cult in the middle. But the reason why I do this is because this is what the scholar, it, it's talked about a lot. Because, because I think we need to talk about it because we've become uh, disconnected from this. We need to put it in its place. So I just want to briefly, I want to come back to this in a much more experiential way in a moment. Because I don't want to stay in the world of theory because I think it can, we can get in our heads too much. Uh, but... <clears throat> it's important. The reason I included these things on the side is because they came up across the board amongst all 18 scholars. Because in the conceptualization of the soul for the purpose of something like psychology, helping somebody develop and grow, they could, they, all of them said, like, well, it doesn't matter so much that you understand the structure of the soul because what matters is that you're move, there's movement towards Allah. And so, they, they talked about these things. This tension here that Professor Malik talked about, the devil and the, uh, the pig and the lion, shaitan, right? So the pig and the lion is mukhlikat. Mukhlikat is part that's down here. This is Ghazali's terminology. Mukhlikat is like uh, similar to the vices in 
Aristotelian philosophy. SubhanAllah. <laughs> Be careful of the muhlika. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being struck down by lightning talking about that. So, Muhlikat is the uh, vices like the pig. Muhlikat is the pig. So it's not just greed, it's, uh, it's anger, it's aggression, it's jealousy, it's things that get mired in this downward pull of the nafs. Of I want, I want what the nafs wants, I want to be high power, I want to have this, right? And so he talks about the muhlikat as diseases of the heart. But then he talks about the munjiyat as cures of the heart. The cures of those diseases. So every disease has a transverse opposite as the cure. And so, and these are things like in, in Aristotle's view, that now Ghazali and a lot of take from Aristotle, build on it, but there's, they add to it much more that is directly derived from Islam that you don't find in the Greek version. And so, things like, but things like um, wisdom and justice and um, things that are this higher aspect of character, right? So, munjiyat are these lower things that um, are sort of ugly, bad character traits. Mun Sorry. Muhlikat are these bad character traits. Whereas Munjiyat are these high aspirations of character traits that were exemplified in, as the, the prophets. Saviors. The saviors. And then, in the middle, again, all of our focus is in the purple. This is what we're concerned with. This tahdib al-akhlaq. is the refinement of character. And we know from the life of the Prophet ﷺ and from Hadith, there's so much emphasis on character, on, on akhlaq, on the development of character, because it's this work of refining our soul to be shining uh, the light of the ruh and becoming more within our fitra of this higher aspect of ourselves. And so, the, this tahdib al-akhlaq is a process. It's not a thing. Right? These are like descriptions of character traits. The muhlikat munjiyat. The lion and the pig are both down here. But, like, so this lion, in, in its negative aspect, it's going to be like dominating and aggressive, right? But in its higher aspect in Munjiyat, there's courageousness for the sake of goodness and sake of Allah. When you're doing this work of refining your character. And so, again, everything has this cure to it. So there's the diseases of the heart and the cures of the heart. So these are connected, this process is connected to this called the, the controlling center. Because this is where we do this process and where our focus is of turning, changing. On the other side, and again, these are just processes to understand because it came up, the scholars talked about how these concepts are key to understanding the development. And so everybody hears about the stages of the nafs, right? Nafs al-lawama is this middle part where this uh, lawama means self-reproaching in the sense that it's... Um, Putting it, holding itself accountable, having reflection, having, um, or even sometimes it, it's in the fact of like, you, you know, you need, you need to work on that because it's not, it's a, awareness that it's either going into nafs al -amara. And so nafs al -amara, uh, is, like Professor Malik said, when the soul is mired in this nafs, this downward pull of, uh, again, connected to the characteristics of the muhlika, and it is feeding into what the nafs wants, not making an effort necessarily to elevate. And then most, I would say, in 
psychotherapy or in working with a, a person, most of the work is here with nafs al -lawama. A lot of people talk about many more levels of the nafs. Uh, some people say there's five levels, some people say seven, but the, the most Agree, the most agreement that I found that is spoken the most of is these three stages of the nafs. Um, so, nafs al mutmaina is uh, a rare thing. Most people will not get there, but you can cross into this state because, again, it's the state that the soul is in. Sometimes you're uh, in a good state. And you cross into this, but you may not stay there as a maqam, as a station, or like a hal, right? And then somebody can come all the way up to nafs al-mutmaina and fall all the way back down in nafs al -mara. It's not, when you make progress, it's not guaranteed that you stay there. Because none of this is a static process. It is dynamic. And so the reason why it's so much important focus is on here is because we have to be diligent in this battleground to keep ourselves pure and um, oriented towards this upward drive and this upward movement, but always continually working. So it's not about trying to achieve this unattainable place where we live here, but it's constantly being focused and doing the work to orient towards this direction. Because the, what we know is we're always going to have this battle. There's always going to be things pulling us down. We have enough. We have that can be nafsamara. And, and it even if we do really good in this work at times in our life, and we even cross into like in between here, then something happens and we forget, and it pulls us back down here and we come back into ghafla. And so it's this dynamic thing, we're always sort of either here or there based on the work that we're doing here. And I am specifically pointing to this physical location in my body. And, and this is where I think moving from theory to practicality is extremely important, much more important than this shapes and busyness. And so the, the work that we're doing in this battleground, uh, the things that were most described, these, this term jihad enough and tazkiyat enough. Now, you could conceive of tazkiyat enough being a part of jihad enough. Because jihad enough is basically this doing this work of the battle, struggling against the soul. So anything you're doing to move from nafs and in the state of nafs lawama of reproaching, doing this work of making an effort to uh, clean and be uh, have these saviors come out? You're doing jihad enough. You're struggling with the with the soul, which we which we understand from the Prophet ﷺ is the greater jihad. But then tazkiyat enough. Still, you could conceive of that as part of jihad enough. But the people, the, the the scholars talk about it as this more advanced level of refining and polishing the soul. Really cleaning the heart so that it, and I, I'm going to explain what that process does. Yeah, yeah. tahliya is, is, so the, there's a bunch of T words. <laughs> tahliya, tezkiya, uh, tahliya, I think there's like three or four more. Yeah. They're all similar in that they're um, doing work of purification. Purification of the heart. You talk, sometimes you hear purification of the soul, but again, uh, this terminology, the heart is like the center of the soul. So we're, that's really where we're focusing our purification. Tazkiyat al-Nafs is more concerned with um, polishing an already relatively clean heart. Whereas Jihad al-Nafs may be more considered just like getting these big crusted things off the heart that's veiling you from even recognizing. You know, it's like really doing this base work of orienting yourself. Tesquiet enough, I think, is a more refined process. All this was just to get to this point. And this is something that the, these scholars that I interview also brought as a really important concept, is that the, uh, the, the goal is to orient ourselves and our clients 
towards our spiritual reality. To, and and the, there's something that's keeping us and blocking us from that inner spiritual reality. And we learn about that we have black spots that are on our heart. These black spots, that the, the, um, they cover over the access to that purity and that purification. The purification process is cleaning those black spots. So you could also talk about it as the kalb gets crusted over. There's a crust mm. or a rust in, in the Quran it's mentioned that covers over the kalb. So I've removed the akal just for our clarity for now. We're talking about the inner heart. You get these black spots from, let's say, even simple things. You were a baby. You had good parents that didn't mean any harm. And you spilled juice on the carpet. And your father had a hard day at work. He was a good man. He was trying to make money. And he comes in and he yells, Ah, I just paid for that carpet and you spilled on it. And in that moment, the, the child, because it's so open and pure, does this, oh, uh, you know, do you not love me? And there's this covering that happens of like being removed from the love of Allah. And this black spot forms from these simple experiences like this, of this, we're, because we're oriented towards the dunya and we forget, we're in separation. The child is, is, has came into this world completely in witnessing of Allah. But then through these experiences, little by little, they crust over, there's a crust that builds up through these black spots over that purity. Just by nature of being a human being in the dunya. And then people who have really traumatic experiences, you can imagine the amount, these black spots become much larger, they're much harder to clear. Because they have really severely traumatic experience, much more than spilling juice on the carpet. But it's part of the human process. We are going to get black spots. And so what happens is, we get this over our lives, especially lives that are, are oriented towards the self, and our separation, our understanding of who we are based on our juice carpet experiences, uh, we have this veil over our heart. And therefore, the ruh, the inspiration that comes through the ruh, can't uh, penetrate. And so what's happening is, the work that's happening in this middle, through Teskiyat enough purification, it's chipping away at this crust that's covering our heart, so that what? So that the ruh can shine on the kalb. And then what happens is the kalb, that, ruh, that light that's shining from the ruh, which is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but subhanAllah, He gave us this access to His light. This, this light comes into the kalb, and then it can shine on the nafs. When this is removed, the ruh, the spirit, the light can then shine on the nafs and purify the nafs. But it's this, this inner center of ourselves that if we don't do the work to remove these things that are blocking us and live in this spiritual reality that exists inside of us, then we do not have access to raise to these higher levels of our fitra because we're, we're, we're blocked from it. And so, um, Ghazali talks about this inspiration that comes to the ruh as being light. He says, he, and he, he described this light, or this, he described this like divine inspiration that comes here, like, which can be in the form of knowledge. Like you can just divinely in, be inspired to understand things. And he says that this, this divine inspiration is light that distinguishes reality and falsehood and by which one finds a way out of uncertainties. So it's this yaki luna, this, the heart seeing clearly and being able to see things as they are, right? And so um, then this concept of the light is, is used a lot. This light shining on our hearts, it, it's coming through divine inspiration. And um, we know from the hadith recorded by Ibn Abbas that the Prophet used to pray for light 
in his heart. Allah grant me light in my heart, in my hair, in my skin, in my bones. And then in the Quran, it says, those who are, uh, those whose breasts are enlarging with Islam are upon a light from their Lord. The Prophet was asked about this, what is this enlarging? What is this enlarging? And he said, it is an expansion of the chest. An actual, he responded by saying, it's not, it wasn't, it's not this theoretical abstract thing, like literally a physical uh, enlargement of the chest. <sighs> to let that light into the crusted heart center. When you take a breath, what happens to your chest? It expands. It expands. It enlarges because it's filled with air. But what are we? We're, we're breathing in something that's coming from out. So we're breathing in. We're, we're being filled with this light. If we do it consciously, we can orient ourselves toward opening our hearts to access the divine light to break away this crustedness over our hearts. And this is, for me, how I practice Islamic psychology. It's not so much talk therapy. Because can you get somebody to access their heart and allow their heart, their chest, to enlarge in with light of Islam. Remember, Islam is a state, a state of Islam, being in a state of surrender to Allah and, and in witness of Him. I ask, like, can, can we do that simply by talking to people? I certainly haven't been able to. It's a tool. Talking is a tool to get people oriented towards this. But ultimately, what I have found to supersede and surpass any work in psychotherapy is physically orienting people towards this place in their physical body. From here to here, and from here to here. Like Baba Malik was saying, there's a connection with the spiritual heart to the physical organ of the heart. The physical organ of the heart happens to be located in this place. It also happens to be the center of our, it's our solar plexus, the center, right? And so, we in the West, this, this notion of, you know, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. We've been dominated by this notion of living in the akal only, only rationality. Our identity is is, is formulated by our thoughts. You, I ask people, how do you feel? They, don't, they just tell me what's happening to them. They tell me their thoughts. It's very difficult for... I, usually I have to say, okay, that's great. How do you feel? And then they say, well, you know, she did this to me. And, you know, I was like, okay, but w what is the sensation of that? Like, what is the feeling of that? Because what I'm trying to do is orient people towards the heart center that actually physically is located. Remember yesterday uh, we talked about holistic, holistic vision of healing. And it, it involves the body. And why Hakim Marcelletta sort of went back and forth between spirituality and physicality because there's not necessarily a separation. We need to identify our, our connecting with our souls. And our souls occupy our being. They're not sectioned off into specific organs. What this does now, it challenges it. And it says now that you know, this is about a deeper spiritual yeah. aspect of who you are yeah. and what you bring to the table. So it kind of requires us to kind of really get into tune with who we are as Muslims and where our own levels and Absolutely. states are, inshallah. Absolutely. And this presents a challenge. A huge because, challenge. Yes, because then, is, then if, we've been, if we ourselves have been walking in this world as Muslims at a certain or a particular level and there's no mirror to yeah. our own development, then we have to have something that gives us the feedback we need yeah. to improve ourselves. It's a pretty high expectation for a career path, exactly. right? 
I mean, we're talking about like psychologists as a career path. You know, people will study engineering and they go and they you get a degree. Halas, I can make money now. But from what our standpoint, and this is what people do in psychology. But from our standpoint as Islamic psychologists, that is that is not nearly even scratching the surface. Because really, in, in my discussions with clinicians in this work, this notion of um, our role as professional mirrors, our, our profession is being this mirror that helps reflect what this reality is in the cold. You can't be a mirror if you're not you haven't done some serious work of removing the crust over you from your own heart. Because then what are you reflecting? You're projecting, to use a word from Western psychology, you're reflecting the crust on your own heart. You're reflecting your nafs orientation. You're reflecting your identity of the self. You're reflecting what your expectations are for this other person based on your bad character qualities that you haven't purified and cleaned. And then it's a matter of who's, who's guiding this work. You know, if you're, if you're mired in the self, and you have your own notions and ideas, and I'm going to come in here and I'm going to heal this person. My job is to heal this person. No, it's not. Allah heals people. We don't have any part in the healing. We're just as bad. But we can't be good as bad if we're blocked ourselves, or we even have these cognitive understandings of our position somehow. Our position is just being slave and being open receptors to help reflect. Which is why, you know, it is, it's as simple as Professor Skinner says it, like I don't do anything, I just sit there and I stand, I get in a state. For somebody who's been doing it for so long, it's easy to say that. But then I, I've, I've asked him, because I, I, the reason I was asking this is, how do we teach people how to do this? And he's like, I just get in a state. And I'm like, okay, yes. But like, I can't, we can't have a curriculum on that, <laughs> you know, like, and so people need to understand all these things to orient themselves to do the aqal, the kalb, the, what's most important is, is just connecting with your heart and cleaning it. Now, there's a whole tradition of how we do that, that we need to tap into. This is tetzkiyat the nafs. So it's work. It is so much work. It is dedication. It's tarbiya, it's discipline. It's not, I want to, um, I want to make, I want to have a Mercedes and I want to help people. So I'm going to be a psychologist because I can make a good living. There's nothing wrong with making a living. But remember, ikhlas, like having your intention, first and foremost, the reason why I love what I do is because I found a way to actually make, it's not a great living, but I make a living Doing the only thing I would want to do my whole life is just work on myself. But I, if I go and I become an engineer, or a, you know, nothing wrong with the engineers. I love engineers. We need engineers. But what I'm saying is, how beautiful to get to to to, you know, in order to be a good therapist, in order to you know, professional development in our case, is our own development. And so the more that we learn how to remove the crust from our heart is the only way we'll be able to help people remove their own crust from their heart and most of that is really about transmission if you can be in a state of a clean heart then you transmit you invite the other person to be in that place and this is what's happening in this professor skinner's <laughs> clinical model of, of of sitting and being with somebody is that but you, we, need to, we need to consciously, like in order, you don't just get there. It's, it's, you need to learn how to do it and you need to practice. And it's, in this case, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice just is, you just have to continually practice. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and it's about constancy, not consistency. Meaning we have to constantly be engaged in this work of Tuski at the Nafs and doing our reflecting on ourselves and cleaning ourselves, um, the constancy is, is creating this, this rope of Allah. You know, so that because we can't we continually waving like this, you need to have this consist, constant practice. Every single day you're doing 
reflection. I mean, this is a pretty high ideal, but so is entrusting the souls of people in our care. It's something really, really we need to take with a lot of gravity. You know, it's not something we want to just do lightly. And so if we're not as serious about our own work for the sake of these other people, then we're doing them and ourselves a disservice. So I, I say that not to scare people away from this work, but what better to be doing with your time? Questions. Everybody hear the question? Yeah. Really, really important question. Um, my, I think people are going to have different orientations to this. I tend to go to the extreme of what Professor Malik is saying, that we need to be spiritual people. We need to be oriented towards spirituality. Therefore, to me, everything is for the sake of Allah and for our spiritual test in this life. And so when somebody has a clinical imbalance, let's say, a clinical biological thing that's creating this um, presenting problem clinically, then we, from the Islamic tradition and from like what we learned yesterday, we're supposed to uh, heal our bodies. We're supposed to work, or work with that biology to come to a place of homeostasis, or right? And so, you, absolutely, if people have, um, I'd say biological things, but it's also trauma. Trauma, people experience trauma and they're in a, a state that they didn't, it's not, it's not this negative thing of like, oh, it's muhlikat, they're bad character traits because they deserved it and it's this nafsi thing. Some people are oriented towards that because they've been victimized totally in, unjustly. And so this is a, a semantic thing that we need to correct in our community is people constantly, even the word tauba, I mean, I might go off a tangent here, but I'll bring it around in a second. Uh, it's not about, um, you know, the Prophet made tawbah a hundred times a day. He was masum. Tawbah is about turning to Allah. We don't need to be so occupied with sin. But so what I'm saying is, say, let's take trauma first, for example. Somebody has trauma and they're experiencing anger because as a result of being beaten or being humiliated or being um, wrongly abused, their symptom of that can be this traumatic response to perhaps it comes out in muhlikat. It comes out in aggression, let's say, or these certain ways that it manifests that create a problem, which is why somebody would come to therapy, because there's something that's not allowing them to function in their normal life, right? So now, orienting towards this model does not mean they're saying, oh, well, you're, you're angry, therefore you've, you've failed this battleground test thing and you're bad and therefore we have to make you good. No. It's just they're human and that's a, a result and so you still, because you still want to deal with sorting out that, you know, however they got there, they are exhibiting these diseases of the heart. So our goal still should be curing the diseases of the heart from a soul perspective. Now. If it's a biological thing, giving them medication, whether it's plant medicine or whether it's pharmaceutical medication, is for the purpose of removing the major thing that's not even allowing the person to sort of even get to the point of doing any type of spiritual work because they're just trying to function. But then what? From an Islamic perspective, is that enough for us? Are we just trying to get them to function? I don't think so. I, don't, I mean, from a Western perspective, that would be enough. Great, halas, we got their psycho, um, psychotic episodes under control with this medication. They can live in their house. They can you know, maybe even have a job. We've, we've succeeded. But that, that's still just a dunya-oriented life. So we can use psychotropic medications. I prefer as much as possible to use natural things for what I described yesterday. But Sometimes we don't have access to those things. We have to use psychotropic medications for what? To get the person to a place so they can start to do this work. Because they're still going to Akhira. They're still going to be on the day of judgment held accountable for what's in their soul. But some of them are not going to be held accountable to the things that they didn't earn themselves. And, so, and, and even sometimes 
people who we call psychotic. We have this whole tradition of, of Majnun people who, well, I've talked to Shayuk about this, and so, this isn't across the board, but some people, uh, a sheikh told me that sometimes a person is in this state of Majnun as a protection for them. Allah put this condition in them to protect them from something else because by nature of their soul, if they didn't have that, they would fall into something else that they would then be held accountable for on the Day of Judgment. So it's a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be given this state because it's going to put them in a better place in Akhirah. <laughs> Mind cha game changer again, right? Because we're always dunya oriented. We're always like, oh well, we want things to be comfortable in the dunya and we want to remove these psychotic things. Psychoticness only exists in the dunya. Souls aren't psychotic in Akhirah. And so, to, to, to add on to your question, Khaled, it's you may never do this work with some client. Right. You know, they may not be ever ready to do it. But you need to assess that. Right. And if they are ready, you have to you have to do this work with them. We're still within the model of regular psychotherapy, we're still we're still our first concern is somebody's safety. Right. You know, like I'm not, you can't, you can't heal a person's soul for that, but if they're not alive, you know, we, safety, you know, if they're in an abusive situation, you deal with getting them out of that abusive situation. You don't say like, okay, let's connect with your heart and heal your heart and then put you back into this abusive situation. So I want to make sure that that's clear. But once you've sorted all that stuff out, you know, and because oftentimes, I mean, I know people who've been in therapy for eight years every week, and like, and I'm, I'm like, where have you taken them? Like, what, what, where are we going? Right. Um, and so it shouldn't. Sometimes it, they'll never get there, like I said. But there's some things that seem like they'll take forever to sort out. It doesn't really take that long once they have what they need to just be able to realize, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm safe. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? get that all sorted out, then, in his words, you can self-actualize. In our words, you can witness Allah. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Like, do you have to wait till you get to a certain level of cleanliness in your heart to work with people? I want to say sort of, yeah, because then it's an ethical issue, right? But no, but there is no, I mean, you can't say, okay, now I'm clean enough. Like, it's an ongoing process, and it's going to be totally different for everybody. But at the very least, I would hope that people go through these type of training sessions to at least be oriented towards the to have the tools, and to know, and to have some sort of supervision level to know, like, okay, you're doing, you know, have a pious rafiki at least. Um, but then, like, it's an it's an ongoing life process. So yeah, you can't say like, I'm ready because there's no end to the journey. Fatima. Mm, great question. Okay, she's saying like um, the concept of black spots accumulating on the heart. Black, I mean, unfortunately the word black has a negative connotation. I see Hassan nodding his head. Uh, <laughs> black is the trouble. Yeah, right. Sure. But, but, but it's covering over. It's, uh, um, we, we, you know, people want to like... Um, say kafir, we call everybody a kafir. But to a certain degree, we, we cover over our hearts daily, oftentimes, right? Um, uh, kafara, it's this process of covering. And so I think you can conceive of the black spots as a, a covering on the heart or a veiling to the heart in that case, that a, a traumatic experience that has nothing to do with somebody's badness or blackness in their heart, it, they can still be completely innocent, but the, that act of being in the dunya and that experience put a veil on their heart between them and Allah. Uh, manifestation of this idea of bringing light into the heart so that we can start to, with that light, break through the crust, those, those black spots or the veiling on the heart. When you start to enlarge in, it's like you're letting little by little, you're letting this light come in. And when light comes into darkness, darkness fades. Darkness gets obliterated. 
the light always penetrates the darkness. And so the process for me of healing the heart, which is what I'm concerned of in psychotherapy, is finding ways of allowing this light to be enlarging in the chest, to penetrate those uh, coverings in our heart, to bring that light into our heart. 